you ready to go? Thank you. Yes, yes, I'm ready to go. So hi, everyone. Um, my name is Bethan Perkins. I am um, a product owner on Daphne and a co-tech lead, um, along with Tom Gowland. Um, so I'm going to give you a demonstration of one of the, the, the data side of the platform, as Brian mentioned, and then I'll hand over to Tom, who can look more at the modeling side. So this is, I hope you can see my screen, shout if not. Um, this is the front page of the platform web interface. Um, one thing you might notice is that there isn't a registration button. So at the moment, if you want to come on board the Daphne platform or you have some collaborators or students or someone who you think would benefit from joining the platform, then just drop us an email. There'll be details at the end of this um, webinar as well. Um, but Marion, Tom, Brian or I would all be able to help you get set up with an account. So once you have that account, then you can log in. I'm logging in as a kind of standard non-administrator user that we use for demos. Um, and then you can see here the main components of the Daphne system, so data models, workflows, and the management of assets. I'll cover data and managing assets, and Tom will look at models and workflows. So if we look at the data um, on the platform at the moment, then uh, the data pages, we can see that there are at the moment available to this particular user, there are 668 data sets. That isn't the entire sum of data sets available on the Daphne platform. So some of the data sets which uh, live on the platform are hidden from this particular non-admin user. And I'll show you in a second how to make a data set, but that data set that I created will only be visible to me. So we do have permissions, data permissions uh, on the platform and some control over who can see what. So this, these pages were re, uh, reinvigorated, revamped recently, and we've really put the emphasis now on uh, searching for data, so data discovery. Um, you can filter on the source of the data set uh, and the subject of the data set and the format of the data set. So, for example, if you were interested in Department for Transport data sets and you wanted to see what they had that was a shape file, then you could narrow that down and come up with HS2 proposed root files. Um, Yep, I think that's pretty much, that's it. It's essentially, hopefully, a straightforward, easy to use searching interface. Um, I will show you how to add data. Um, so we ask users to um, upload data to the Daphne platform. It really is a kind of community driven database um, at the moment. So the steps for uh, uploading data to the Daphne platform are fairly straightforward. So you start off in the, the data entry page with a drag and drop or browse for files. I've got some very simple files here. So a simple text file in CSV that I drop in. Um, I have the opportunity, if either of these conform to a particular standard, I have the opportunity to add that in here. I'm not going to do that there, but it's there for the record. Um, and then once I'm happy that my files are as I would like for this particular data set, then I click to confirm that and then press upload. This upload happens in the background while I can then go in the complete metadata. That's happened very quickly because they're very small files. But the idea here is that you could uh, upload substantially larger files and take the time whilst that is uploading to complete the metadata for that data set. So for this particular data set, I'm just going to go through and put in some metadata quickly. So test data set for Imperial demo. Um, and let's make that the description as well, for example. So here we have an opportunity for you to provide a DOI or other fixed external identifier. Um, I've got an example of a DOI here. I just have to move my screens around. Here's one I made earlier. So this is a random DOI, um, which we'll see again when it comes through to the data set detail page. Um, we ask users to provide a subject. So we're taking um, some Inspire uh, categories from ISO 19115. Um, and this, uh, this is mandatory. Um, this is what the search is done on. So when you're searching by subject, this is the subject that people are searching on. So let's say, for example, we're looking at uh, health. That seems like an appropriate topic at the moment. Then we have some extra categories that you could choose here. Uh, if you wanted to, so I'll just choose some random ones. Um, and these are again following another inspired uh, vocabulary. And um, we ask for an, a language for your data set. English is the, the typical, but we do have the other British Isles languages at the top of the list there. Um, any keywords that you have? So test, test data, for example. 
again, whether your um, data set conforms to any uh, standard, so like an ISO standard, we have an example there that you might want to add into your data set. The next section is on the spatiotemporal coverage of the data. So at the moment in the search area, um, you can search on temporal coverage. Um, and we have got the capacity to search on spatial coverage as well. It's just not plumbed in yet, um, but it's on the list. Um, and so because the data files that you can upload are, are anything, really, you could be uploading a shape file or an Excel spreadsheet or a PDF, then it's beyond the scope of, of the platform at the moment to be interrogating any type of file in order to extract spatiotemporal bounds for data sets. So we ask the user to declare the spatiotemporal bounds of that data and you know, to, to improve its searchability in future. So if I said central London here, good. So we're using uh, the GeoNames um, catalog for searching. I'll give a, an example that gives a few more uh, results here actually. So I know for example that Didcot where we're based uh, at STFC has quite a few different results um, in the GeoNames catalog. So I would choose Didcot United Kingdom and then you can just validate that that is where you expect it to be in the map here. Um, and then for spatial, for temporal coverage, let's say that we have a data set which covers these days. And then this is then used for that search on the search page. Um, so the penultimate section is on data set ownership outside of Daphne. So we're very aware that Daphne shouldn't become a kind of separated silo that lives on its own and has no relationship with the outside world. So this is um, in future, we're probably looking at linking out to external repositories and um, computationally putting in links between external data sets. But at the moment, so we're, we're supporting that kind of link outside Daphne with um, more information about the organization that created the data set and some contact details. So I'll go with Daphne just for this example. So you need an identifier as well. You can add in any people if you want to shout out about a particular person's involvement in this data set, then you can add those people in as well, again, with an ID for them. Uh, you have to say when the data set was created, let's say it was created today. You can optionally set an update frequency um, if you yeah, if that's appropriate to your data set. If you have publishing information, so for example, if you're holding your data on data.gov, if there is intermediate republishing site for your data, then you can declare that here. And then finally, there's a human being contact point. So I'll put in my, that's my personal one. Let's not use that one. <laughs> Um, email address here. So the idea here is that there's always a human being that you can contact at the end of a data set um, to find out about it, to um, ask questions, for example. Again, making that link to the outside world, world beyond Daphne. Uh, and finally, we have uh, data use restrictions. So we mandate that their license comes with the data. We suggest CC by four as a, a first pass example so that your data is open by default. If you want to change that, then that's fairly straightforward to do. So let's say you wanted to use the MIT license instead. You can also declare any rights, usage rights on your data. Um, this is probably quite typical for things. So there's an example here, with the open government license rights you may want to put into your uh, declare in your metadata. Then finally, we ask for an update note. So this is much like a uh, commit message on GitHub, if you're familiar with GitHub. So this just says what this upload of data or metadata was. So this will be uh, initial upload of data. Then read the terms and conditions, agree to them and publish. And then we have our data set popped up here. So if we then navigate to the page for the data set, this is how data sets are presented on the Daphne site. So we can see all of that metadata that we created is presented back to us here. Uh, the identifier, that DOI that I produced, the, the description, the contact point here, and that produces, if you look in the bottom left corner of my screen, a mail to link. So that email address is, is available to people on the platform. Um, Look, coming down a bit, we've got the, the lovely map showing the area. Uh, we also have the files themselves. And then additional met metadata that we added in, uh, much of which was not mandatory. So I didn't actually complete here, but this would all be demonstrated here. So everything that you put in onto that metadata page is, is returned back in the, um, uh, in the dataset detail page. 
uh, in the top corner here, then we've got some information about using data on the Daphne platform. So uh, it's showing here that this data is open access and access as the owner of the data set. It's worth saying this is open access to me, to this particular user. Um, and this particular user is accessing that because they are the owner of this asset. Um, as a matter of fact, no one else on the Daphne platform could see this yet because I haven't shared it with anyone. It's totally private to me at this stage. The license information is here and there's a data set ID and a data set version ID which are minted when I create the data set, which Tom will show you um, are required if you want to use this data set in a model. So we give them to you here. So you've uploaded your data set. Let's say you wanted to change something, then you could come in here, upload some new files, update some of the metadata, write a new commit message, and then publish a new version. And there is actually, we're keeping a version history of changes to the data sets. Metadata changes just kind of flow through, but if you change the actual files themselves, then we keep a version history of how those files have changed. Um, that said, you have control, so you could delete a version if you decide that the files that you uploaded for that particular version are not appropriate for whoever you're sharing them with, um, or you can delete the entire data set if you would like to. So that's mostly it for data um, and uploading data to the platform. Uh, here's the temporal range area where you could search for data within the temporal range that you've specified. So the next thing I think is just to show you briefly about asset management. So I said that that data set was not visible to others on the platform and I'll prove it. So I've got a second non-administrator user here. I'm going to log in in an incognito window as that user. And if I look at data, then we see that the test data set is not available to this user. So that would have pinged up at the top of the list. So if I, but I can share that data set with this non-admin, second non-admin user. There's two ways of doing it. The first way is to make the data set public. So that's fairly straightforward. You have a list here of all the data sets that you are an owner of, and you can manage that. So to make it either view only, where all users on the platform see the metadata for this data set, but not the actual files themselves. They can't download the files, but they do see, for example, the email address of the contact point to ask, et cetera, for more information. Or full access, where that you see the page as I showed it to you earlier with files and everything available. So you can use that interface to open up the data set to everybody on the platform, or you can use a relatively new groups facility to create a group of users and share information, share data with that group. So I've got one I've made earlier. Creating a group is super simple. So just put in a name and a description. I have one I've created earlier. So this is a group of non-admin one who created the group and non-admin two, whose um, picture we saw earlier. Um, so in this group, I can now add uh, the test data set for the Imperial demo. I can say that non-admin user two has the ability to view, read and update. So they would be able to create new versions of that data set. And then if all goes well, so if we come back to non-admin two, their view of the data sets should now update. So yeah, perfect. So they can see that data set is available to them now and they have access to it because it's been shared through the group. And if we click on this, then we can see that it's accessed as part of the demo group group 